This episode of Around the Layout is brought to you by NERX, the northeastern region of the NMRA's virtual convention. Tune in Monday, March 18th through the 21st as the NER delivers a fantastic lineup of how-to clinics, roundtable discussions, and layout tours right to your screen. Be sure to check out the amazing work in the model showcase and tips and tricks, short video segments showing modeling tips that don't fit into a full clinic. NERX, it's like being at a convention without leaving your home. For a full schedule, check out their website at nerx.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Around the Layout, where model railroaders come to tell their story. My name is Ray Arnott. So glad you could join us. It's time once again to find out what's happening in model railroading. And joining me to do that, the editor of Model Railroad News, Tony Cook. Tony. Hey, Ray. How you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. It's like I just saw you, but I did because we last <laughs> night we recorded the uh, live. We gave away uh, the, that great book that you uh, provided and along with White River Productions. And boy, I think that's going to be a really nice piece for the person that won it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. But today is what's happening. And of course, we bring on newsmakers in the hobby and I don't think there's anybody who makes more news and some really cool releases than Chris Palmieri. Very busy guy. He's a very busy guy. Lots, lots of stuff and always exciting to see because it's railroads that many of us don't know. Absolutely. So let's bring him in. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ray. Good morning, Ray. Tony, how are y'all? We're doing fantastic and it's great to see you and you know, we're just looking at some of the, the the stuff that's going on with home shops, and we've been chatting here for a little bit about all the projects that you got going on, and the list seems very long. So, uh, you you seemingly are a very busy man when it comes to projects and products being released, and a whole bunch of things going on. Yes, sir. I wonder on a daily basis what I've gotten myself into, but it is rewarding. <laughs> uh, uh, but yes, busy. If you don't know what Home Shops is, you may be under a rock, so you may want to try to get yourself out from underneath it. But for somebody that may not know the the, the whole premise of, of why you created Home Shops, why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Well, the uh, mission of Home Shops is to bring um, quality factory painted freelance equipment uh, to market, to, to layouts, because I'm a freelance model railroader myself. I developed my own Meridian Speedway concept, Texas and Great Northern and Natchez Trace and Orient Railroads are the components. And I've got a website, meridianspeedway.net, um, that uh, is uh, devoted just to that concept. And as this uh, went along, I became more and more, fell more and more in love with the, the freelance concept, just because of the freedom to be able to, to create your own thing. But one of the challenges is uh, if you want to get freelance equipment on your railroad or in your fleet, you have to paint it yourself. And, um, man, there's just a lot of really cool freelance model railroaders out there that um, have beautiful cars, wonderful concepts, believable concepts. And uh, it occurred to me that the only way to get these cars painted and factory level quality uh, products is to start a company and, and go and start getting it. So that's exactly what I did. And uh, in 2021, we started. And uh, I don't know, we're about... Uh, Eight products actually uh, have been released so far and uh, many more in the works. So it's very exciting uh, what we're doing. So eight different releases so far. That's uh, You've done things with what, Tangent, Intermountain, Rapido, several companies. How does that work exactly? I mean, do you, you know, how do you get that started? You know, do you find a prototype or something in their catalog and then approach them? I know a lot of times they're tacked on to regular production runs. So what's kind of the, you've got an idea, I'm going to do these home roads and I want to approach a manufacturer. Kind of take us through, how does that start? Well, it starts a little bit differently with each manufacturer, but in, in every case, what we produce is indeed tacked on to one of their production runs. There's no tooling something just for what we want to do. And it originally started with me uh, reaching out to a number of manufacturers and uh, Tangent responded right away and, um, Dave Lelback and Dan Kohlberg are just awesome to work with there. And uh, basically, they let us know what cars are on, on, the, on the docket here to be, be produced. And uh, I look at it and try to find good fits for each car type with uh, prototype railroads. And I reach out to those road owners. And 
some some products are a go and some some are not a good fit and we we shelve the road for another another car so um uh, most of the manufacturers will announce um well in advance what what they've got coming up so I'm, I'm always vigilant for that those announcements on on social media and if i see a car that looks like it's something that uh, i want to get in on if i don't already have a relationship with that manufacturer you know I'll, I'll i'll reach out and introduce myself and and see what's going on a couple of manufacturers have actually reached out to me as well to start that conversation because you know, it's we generate a lot of excitement for 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 them as well, and it's it's added volume to their factory runs. So it's a, just a good fit for all the manufacturers. You've seemingly have become like kind of a hub of freelance model railroading. I'm noticing, and of course, that's paid off dividends for me because you just seemingly keep the list of great freelance model railroaders to interview. And I think eventually you're going to start charging me a finder's fee for those guests, <laughs> but. When you get these cars and when you start to see something that you say, okay, this is going to be a good for a home shop's run, that selection process, are you looking for, you know, matching the freelance model railroads operation to the car type? How, how does that process go along as far as deciding, okay, this is a good freelance railroad for this project? Well, in many cases, the freelance railroads I reach out to are folks who have been posting, um, you know, some of their material online on the freelance Facebook pages or people that have been published. So I've got an idea for kind of the feel for what, what, what kind of cars would be a good fit for the for the railroad. You know, for example, this Rapido box car that we did, the um, uh, the SPB70 version, the 5358 F, uh, FMC PC and F box car. All the road names are pretty much uh, carriers that would serve the paper industry, which is what that car is designed for. It's a double door, 50 foot box car. And, um, you know, j just reached out to them one by one. Hey, I think we're going to do this project with Rapido for this box car. I went to Joe Loggins with the Arkansas Valley. What do you think? Is this, is this a good fit? Is this a car we should do? And that conversation it just starts organically. But most of the cases, um, it's I've, I've already got the vision in mind that this car is a good fit based on what I've seen the road owners share online. I always see on the, the cars, I'm always impressed by how realistic and how professionally they're done. Where does the, I assume all of these, that's part of doing freelancer home roads that you don't design or create any of the graphics for them? Do they come to you and say, this is my logo, this is the typeface that I like for, you know, spelling the name out on the left side of the boxcar, and I've got this logo for it, and these are my colors? Like, is there any involvement in helping design, or do they already have that in place? Is that part of my home road, this is what we do, and they already know it and have it? Well, for some folks, it's a more, uh, it's a, a more labor intensive process than for others. In most cases, the road owners have already had decals made. Uh, so there's vector art for their logos, but we've got a check sheet of all the spec items that the cars will um, need to have. What, what font is on the, on the, the main road name? What font will the reporting market numbers be? What will be the date range for the, the built dates of these cars? What exactly is the color? Do we need to get a color chip or does it match a scale code or a local color? We go through all those items and, and check them off um, with the road owners. And in many cases, the, um, you know, the manufacturers already have something close and we can, we can match, you know, like for instance, the Arkansas Valley blue car, um, we we sent scale trains a scale coat Conrail blue paint chip, you know, and they matched it. And that Arkansas Valley Rapido car matches the tangent repeat Arkansas Valley cars that we did because we also provided them with the scale coat to um, Conrail blue paint chip. So we we go through every one of the the items in detail, and we'll, we'll get right down to: Do you need to have? Do you want to have special stenciling on the car to indicate it's in a certain pool assigned to a certain customer? And then, of course, we do our, our trust plate uh, signature, you know, where each each trust stencil has some sort of clue as to the road owner's name. So all those details we go through and it's anywhere from a five email back and forth conversation to a hundred email back and forth conversation <laughs> based on how developed and how engaged the, 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 the road owner is. Um, you know, so some of these roads get easier and easier as we do more follow up projects, of course, because we've already got a lot of that 
on file and ironed out. So, uh, but we we have got some um, road owners that have never had decals made since the uh, rail graphics um, era. Those there's no vector art for those, and uh, we'll we'll have to find somebody to redraw that logo based on an ancient crumbling decal set that's out there. And you know those those take a little bit longer, but those projects are rewarding as well. The Sioux Line boxcar we did for the group in Shreveport, that was one of those clubs. They did not have vector art. Um, so we had to completely redraw that Sioux Line font from an old uh, decal set. And it, it's it's spot on. It looks really, really good. But yeah, that's that's part of the fun. You know, if you're a prototype railroader and you you, you find this real rare picture of a Missouri Pacific hopper car and you, you go through all this um, research to, to, to recreate that and make decals, it's kind of the same thing here in the, the freelance world because you, you're going through old magazine articles and, you know, looking for old pictures uh, and, and trying to, to recreate sometimes cars that have uh, or schemes that have been in existence, you know, for 30, 40 years. You talked about vector graphics, and I don't want to get too technical, but this is something I know a lot of people don't understand and I run into this at times with people working on things and they're like, okay, here's our logo. And it's like, oh my gosh, that's a JPEG that you would like to see the size of a full page in one of the magazines that I do. And it actually wouldn't print any bigger than a postage stamp and is going to have a lot of pixelation around it. Can you explain a little bit about, for those that might be working on their own freelance railroad, like, gosh, I wish I knew about this before I started making a 72 DPI JPEG as my logo and now I can't do anything with it, but that's, so it, it just kind of in brief, what does that entail for somebody that's like, yeah, I'd like to get into doing this, but I'm not a computer expert. So what does it need to be on? Well, the two formats uh, that are most widely accepted are um, Adobe Illustrator and Corel Draw. Um, you're, you're spot on with your analogy about a JPEG not being big enough to print. Well, just like printing something on the on a magazine page, you also we're printing stuff on the side of a freight car. And you want the edges to be crisp. You want to be able to put, you know, a loop up to it and read the fine print. And you, you just like you can't get a magazine to print um, a full page photograph that will have that kind of fidelity on it with a JPEG. You can't do that with a freight car. So it's just a, a the type of file. And what, what in short, a vector file, you can make as large or as small as possible and the edges will stay crisp. You don't lose any fidelity or resolution as you make um, a file larger. And that's the kind of file that the manufacturers use uh, when they convert that to the development of the pad printing um, apparatus to actually get that on the side of a car. So most of the folks who are doing their own decals, the guys who make your decals, be it um, Matthew Welke of Circus City, Jim Abbott of Highball Graphics, or um, Bill Brillinger of PDC.ca, and those are just the three big ones. Most of those guys are going to create that vector graphic when you work through your decal project. And most of those guys are those guys will all provide you with that file um, to have. And it's it's a good thing for most folks to want to do um, to, to, to start creating your own standard file of components of your freelance railroad. And that should include if you if you have artwork made, see if you can get that vector file from whoever made it for you. If that's not something you did yourself. And, you know, just just keep that, you know, make it available for your next project. Yeah, it sounds like the struggle of uh, most graphic guys or print houses. I have a friend who does sign work and we, we constantly joke, you know, I'm, I'm printing something that's six feet wide and here's my logo. It's on my business card. It just doesn't compute, <laughs> yeah. you know, it just doesn't work. So, yeah, it's always good to have that vector goodness, as, as he likes to call it, to, to be able to have that, whether you're printing smaller and keeping that detail or printing larger. And there's a lot of different ways to go about it if you do some research to, to get yourself to that vector level. Indeed. We've got one uh, one car in the works. It's a, a freelance model railroad car called the St. Louis County. And it's a freelance of a fellow named Ed Stoll in the Temple, Texas area. And he's he's old school. And I'm, I'm going to try and not use the word old too much in this conversation referring to him. But it, he's old school. And he approached me two years ago at the St. Louis RPM with his concept. And it's it's an older concept. And we haven't had an era appropriate car um released yet but it's it's a project that's in the works with an atlas car 
and of course, no vector file for his logo. And everything he had was made by a print shop in in Temple, Texas. And I reached out to this print shop that had made uh, his logo, and um, um, they were able to and kind enough to send me uh, the the vector file for uh, for the logo for the St. Louis County, which I then provided to. Uh, someone that did the actual artwork for us and now that's in atlas's hands but it's 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 kind of neat to actually reach out to an honest to god print shop to get a vector file for a freelance model railroad uh in in temple texas so that's you know that's just one of the the many paths and that was a fellow who did not have it on file but um we were able to get it on the quantities of these things that's the other thing i would wonder about when you see something announced i don't think we always think about well wonder how many of those they make and I know production runs in general on plastic models were a lot different than they used to be. You know, you go back to like the Athern blue box era and that same whatever was available, you know, for years and years and years. And they made, you know, who knows how many of them. But the market is a lot different now. So I assume that makes it a little more favorable for projects like yours. That would not be a red and silver Santa Fe F7 that's going to be available for the next 50 years. How does that kind of thing factor into, I know you say you tack on to production runs. Uh, I assume everybody's got different quantity amounts or thresholds of, well, we would need to make X number of cars. So how is how is the logistics of that come together? It varies from manufacturer to manufacturer. We prefer uh, manufacturers that will allow us to make a quantity per row number in the 50 range. Uh, some of them are as high as uh, 72 or even 100. Um, and, um, every man, every manufacturer will tell, tell, tell me that the, the minimum order quantity is directly dictated by whichever factory they're working with. Hmm. A couple manufacturers we're working with, you know, their minimum order quantity per car was 300. And that's a bit much for most of the road, freelance road names we have. And, and we've talked them down to 200, uh, for their minimum order quantity divided into four road numbers of 50 each. And that that goes um, relatively well for most of the smaller road names. Um, we prefer to do 150 for the smaller road names or less road names. And there are some manufacturers that will work work with us on that number. And by that, I mean, you know, 150 cars each of three road numbers for each scheme. And that's the recipe we've got with our first Prairie Shadows car that should be announced here very shortly or in our hands very shortly um, and we're we're really excited to be working with with those guys. But uh, you know, it's 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 kind of a guessing game as to which cars are going to sell out quickly and which ones are not. And if if I make the wrong guess, it, we, very quickly we can have too many cars unsold, and that that's that's had happened and had us take a few projects off off the board until until we can move that inventory. So it, we've got to be very careful sizing um, our orders. Yeah, for sure. It's, uh, you know, like you said, it's trying to figure out the, the what's going to be popular, what's going to grab. But I'll, I'll tell you what I find really neat. You hinted at it earlier about some of the you know stuff on the cars and hinting as to who the owner of the car is and where it came from. But I love that Easter egg concept. And in fact, I think in sense, the, the home shops cars on a layout is kind of that neat Easter egg ish kind of idea of something unique and a story to tell and something additional to somebody comes over and sees your layout and sees a superior transfer car go by and says, what is that? I've never seen that, but it, it just, it's a really neat aspect that you've brought to the hobby. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I, you know, I remember rail fanning in the 80s and 90s as a kid, you know, and I'd see a train go by and there's all these cars that I had not seen before. What is what is that short line? What is this short line? And, you know, today when you stand trackside, well, there's another black TILX tank car. And, you know, there's a there's <laughs> another gray ACFX hopper. Right. Or there's another UP box car. It's just not that. Hey, there's something really neat or cool. And what I think this this freelance niche does is it brings that to every era of, of model where, you know, but we have to do it in a way that every car is, is believable. So it, yeah, it's an Easter egg hunt and we want to, we want to hide this Easter egg in plain sight and uh, make it look like it fits. That's interesting. You mentioned like the incentive per diem era. Cause that's what I always think of when I see your box cars mm -hmm. is yeah. I've grown up in the seventies, eighties and seeing all those different things. And like, what is that railroad? 
Again, it's like, well, that railroad may be nothing more than a siding, but they bought 500 boxcars that if they ever came home, there'd be no place to put them. So, <laughs> yeah, it it is a neat thing. And I think that that is part of the allure, I think, of your line is that you can mix them in with contemporary rolling stock and kind of have some of that excitement of what those trains were like that would roll by with all these different IPD cars. Yeah. And it's, you know, the, the, the boxcars certainly fit the IPD footprint. Uh, for sure, uh, we, we do have some more modern modern cars in the works that that aren't necessarily IPD era, but they're different and they're they're cool in the same same sort of hey, what is that that way? You know, so we're excited to bring those out as well. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what's available right now, Chris? I'm, I'm per- perusing the HomeShops.net website, which is very well done, by the way, very easy to browse and see. But why don't you give us a kind of a rundown of what you have available right now? Well, our most recent arrival is the Rapido B70 boxcar. Um, we did that in eight road names, four road numbers each, and uh, one of them is already sold out. Uh, Bob Welke's Wisconsin and Upper Michigan, I think it sold out in about three weeks, um, all wow. 200 cars. So we do have uh, a few of the others left, the Wyoming Valley Western, which is Sam Meehan's road, uh, Jim Abbott of very well-known decal manufacturers, uh, Superior Transfer is there. The Sioux Line is there. Sheldon Frankel's Q&E is there. Quebec and New England, he's got a very popular YouTube channel, lots of content. Uh, this is the first freight car that's been produced for the Q&E. Couldn't resist, so I did my own Texas and Great Northern, had to do it. Um, and, of course, the Ar- Arkansas Valley and the and Southern. So those are available. We have a couple of recent tangent arrivals, the uh, PS4427 covered hopper. Uh, we sold out of the Allagash, and we've sold out of one of the Cat Mountain Santa Fe numbers. Uh, we do have six other Cat Mountain numbers available in quantities right now. Around 20 of each road number are left. And uh, some of the sh- smaller road names in that 4427 were down to uh, single digits of uh, each SKU being available. We also have our Tangent Mini High Cubes. We did uh, one particular road name that sold out in a week, uh, and it's it's on the website. It's sold out. The others um, are doing quite well, um, but they're they're still available. We did our first class one model works car, the uh, the press center flat car. We did that in three road names. Uh, the V and O car has sold out. Uh, we've got uh, two other road names available online, and there's just a handful of the 86 foot box cars that we did a while ago that are that are up on the website available. Uh, the uh, Maryland Southern is very close to being sold out, um, as is the Virginian and uh, uh, Atlantic car that's very close to being sold out. So that's the bulk of what we've got available. Our very first run, the PS4750 with Tangent, all the road names are sold out with the exception of just a handful of Gulf and Ship Island cars. So those are those are on there as well, and I imagine they will not be there uh, much longer. Well, I'm certainly glad I grabbed mine while I could, and what I've really enjoyed about it is, is selection of quality cars. I mean, some of the nicest cars on my layout are home shops cars. You know, the, the detail, the quality, the, the everything else. And it's just a, really well done. And uh, it's not just adding something that's, you know, mediocre quality. You're adding a high quality car to the fleet. So it's been a really cool uh, selection that you have made with manufacturers to keep up that high quality. Well, sure. And that's exactly what we look for. And, and I mean, a lot of manufacturers are doing, you know, high quality stuff uh, today, but it's just it's just too complicated per se to to paint them yourselves and, and get the artwork out there. So I'm, I'm very fortunate to be doing this at this time when so many manufacturers are offering um, great options to choose from. And the, the sky's the limit with what I see on the horizon here. Speaking of out on the horizon, you've done rolling stock so far. And I know that there's a locomotive project that you might be able to share with us. The other thing I've wondered about, and maybe a lot of these roads are past that era, but a caboose. I would think that someone's caboose uh, in in these different roads would be a fun thing as well. And there's so many high-quality cabooses that have come on the market in HO in the last handful of years. How about locomotives and cabooses? Can you comment anything on those ideas or projects? Yeah, uh, I can comment first on the locomotive rumor. We are doing a our first locomotive. It is with Rapido, and it will be the uh, C30-7. We're going to test the waters here with um, a big name, uh, Virginian and Ohio. 
and we're working with uh, Brad and Brady McClellan both on the um, the details of it. Actually, it's it's finalized. The, the final artwork is out there. So we're very excited about that. I don't want to advertise any specifics as far as what Rapido's timeline is, but my expectation is we'll have them in hand hopefully by the end of the year. Um, just just a really fun fun project. And um, you know, VNO VNO Blue there is not a standard paint chip, so it's it's quite a challenge to c communicate amongst different manufacturers what that what that color should be. It's 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 a it's a color that actually um, Alan McClellan has has changed the formula over the over the years several times. So there there is some variance there, um, but we, we're really excited about how this locomotive is going to look and, and come out. We're going to have it uh, in a, of course a very limited quantity. It's quite a quite an investment um, for a, a little organization like me. But they did allow us to split our road numbers into sound and non-sound, which is I'm um, pretty excited about. So each road number, we're going to do three road numbers, just 66 units each, and 18 of each will be a non-sound version. So we'll be able to offer uh, hopefully a little bit of something for everybody, and that's going to be a good litmus test for us. As somebody who's going to invest in uh, rolling stock, the, the the freedom that I have with freight cars is people are going to be less resistant or reluctant to say this car could be on my railroad than they are with a locomotive or, to your point, a caboose. I mean, if you model something in California, you know, would you would you really ever expect a VNO caboose to be out there? If I model something in Florida, would you? ever expect to be a VNO a Vino caboose to be out there. Same could be said with a locomotive. And I mean, obviously we've all got, have seen pictures of a Southern locomotive in California and an SP locomotive in Florida. So, so there's a precedent for it, but because they're top dollar items, I have to make sure before I invest that much that we can sell everything. So hopefully the market responds favorably to the CNO, uh, VNO C30 and uh, we can plow that back into additional uh, locomotive uh, locomotives we'd love to run so uh, we're, we're, we're all eyes on this project to see how it does um, cabooses we don't have any in the works not opposed to it there is one manufacturer I won't name but they they are working with me and one freelance railroad to to produce a, a freelance caboose so um, you'll see announcements for that uh, when when the time is right and and we'll be watching that very closely to see how that does. I can see that C30 from VNO also being kind of falling in the collector's item as well for a lot of folks. I mean, when, when I interview people, how many times Alan McClellan in the VNO comes up as an influence, whether being a prototype modeler or obviously a freelance model railroad or very influential. So even if their layout isn't something that's VNO, that, that ability to collect it and have a piece of that influence on their layout, I'm sure is going to be a, a really neat thing for them to have. Oh, I agree. Absolutely. Um, you know, that's a, that's a statistic I've often sought and wondered if there's any way to quantify, but what, what percentage of the market that's buying equipment is actually buying it and running it and operating it? And which, which percentage of, of the market is, is collecting stuff just because, you know, they want it in their collection and it, it never actually ends up on a, on a layout. So, you know, I can count on one hand the number of people that are actually modeling a VNO layout, right? But, but yet the, the stuff sells. So, yeah, that's 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 the that's the sweet spot there. You know, if, if there are enough people who are just enthusiastic about you know having something unique, and you know, especially with a with a classic freelance road name that you know brings back memories of of you know, the excitement of opening up Model Railroader and reading these articles, you know, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago, that makes projects much more viable than, you know, folks were like, well, this car, you know, it, it misses my day to my layout by three months. So I just can't buy it, you know, and if, if everybody takes that approach, then we end up with a lot of inventory that we can't sell. And that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't let us, uh, you know, reinvest into another project as quickly as we'd like to. So it's it's an interesting game, but I think there will be a lot of people, you know, who would like to collect a VNO locomotive just because of the the sentiment it brings. So that's that was a very large factor in our decision to go ahead and and uh, greenlight this project. That's exciting on the VNO too that there'll be non sound because that is me. I'm one of those collector guys. It'll never hit the rails. It'll probably come out of the box so I can look at it. It goes back in the box. It's like how cool that I have that. 
and frequently on those interesting or odd or unique paint schemes, uh, I am that guy that's hunting around. I just need the standard DC. I don't need to pay the other $100 to have the speaker and the decoder. It's never going to run anyway. So that's awesome that you're going to do both on the C30s, the sound and non-sound versions. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be a learning experience for me here because I'm not sure what the right mix is, you know, sound, non-sound, but I don't want to alienate everybody. And with just 66 of each road number, I was afraid that they would say the minimum order quantity was would, would cause us to have to increase that number for for both uh, to offer both sound and non-sound. But they came back and said we can we can do 18. So we'll, we'll do it uh, uh, and excited to do it. So now you have something that satisfies Tony with the collector. And now <laughs> that, that, that happened with the box. <laughs> yeah. So that, yeah, yes, just yeah. So you can send them the box, but you have a collector <laughs> item now that will fit in Tony's realm. And now you're releasing something that's going to fit in my enjoyment, which is the 50 foot high cubes. And I'd like to think that I had some kind of influence on you, just harassing you all the time when the 40 footers came out and I kept trying to stretch them out to 50, but You've, you've got something coming out on those. So why don't you tell us a bit about that run and uh, what, what you expect from that? I know you hinted earlier, but tell us a little bit more about that. Well, Ray, you definitely had influence. In fact, we'll just call this the Ray R. Not release. <laughs> uh, we Our first car with Prairie Shadows, which is a uh, up-and-coming new smaller manufacturer in uh, Canada. They have a, uh, a hobby shop. And they've decided to get into the freight car business, uh, mostly with N scale at first. Um, but they did the Trenton 5250 covered hopper. And the, the current car that's being released is a um, Trinity 50 foot high Q box car in different versions. And this is uh, what, this is another conversation that started, came out of the St. Louis uh, RPM two years ago. Uh, was the introduction to folks involved with with this with this outfit. We decided to do three road names. Uh, it's a more modern car than what we've come up with, but we've got the um, Brown Brownville and Ashland, uh, which is actually a freelance model railroad that is uh, in Eng it is physically in England. It's a fellow in England that is modeling U.S. freelance, and he's got just an amazing. Uh, Facebook page and following it's it's been quite quite popular and it's a car that I want for myself anyways I've always been a I've been a fan of the Brown um, uh, Brownville and Ashland for a long time so very very cool uh, to have that out there it'll have the conspicuity stripes there's another fellow named Damon Curtis who's got um, his freelance is MD Rail Maryland Rail a lot of Facebook content he's got his own page but he posts it quite a bit over the years to the um, freelance page. And we had done a Maryland uh, Southern 86 foot box car with tangent. And it had a logo with uh, the stylized Maryland flag in it. And what I discovered through this part project and watching these cars sell, there's a lot of people who are diehard Maryland fans. They love that flag. And um, there's another version of a logo with the Maryland flag stylized on the MD rail car. And uh, I know it's going to be very, very popular there. And I also reached out. Uh, we've got one of our one of our regular home shop staples railroads, Greg McComas's Michigan Interstate. When uh, this project first came on the radar, I just the vision was there right away. This is a perfect Michigan Interstate car, and it's modern enough that it can exist in Greg's um, modern era that he currently models. Um, yeah, we're going to do it as, I think, a 94 or 95 build. So I selfishly can have them on my 96 errors layout as well. Um, so we're just doing three road numbers each, 50 each of these cars. And uh, they have arrived at Prairie Shadows in Canada, and they're sorting through the inventory. I expect at any moment here to get the notice that they're ready to ship ship the cars to me. For this small order, we're just going to make them available uh, when they show up here um, as an in-stock uh, stock item. We don't plan to do a pre-sale on this particular car. Always exciting stuff. Amazing, isn't it? What do you think, Ray? Oh, it's awesome. I, it, it, I've i already just been, I jokingly put on Facebook that I'm on homeshops.net, just hitting the F5 key, just refreshing, waiting for those cars <laughs> to arrive. Because I definitely am going to get myself a Michigan interstate car. Of course, I've had the opportunity to operate Greg McComas's layout and got the tour of Mac Rail head, World Headquarters. And uh, looking forward to having that car on my layout and 
Prairie, Prairie Shadow is also releasing some other prototype cars that I'll be adding. So pretty soon I'll have yet way too many 50 foot high cubes on my layout again, but that'll be, uh, <laughs> that'll be just fine. I'll find ways to use them. But Chris, when you do a run and you know, you do your limited edition, and you talked about, you know, there's only so many per run. Do you think you'll ever go back and revisit some of these cars, but maybe in like add a couple different road names or do you you think that may circle back around or is there just too much out in the front of you to just keep doing new stuff? Uh, You know, it's just a matter of timing and availability. I think most manufacturers tend to revisit their own past productions on like a five year interval. So, I mean, you know, the, the cars that I that I've already done, if I want to redo a Tangent 4750, I would have to wait for that to become available. If I want to redo the Serpedo B70, you know, they, they may decide to do it again next year. It may be four or five years before they do that car again. But certainly as a car becomes available to us, if if a manufacturer says we're going to do this car that you did three years ago, absolutely. It's on the table that I would I would consider revisiting, you know. What, what, what I am getting uh, is data, you know, as, as we release a car that has seven or eight road names, you know, the, the, the um, Wisconsin and Upper Michigan box car that sold out in three weeks. Well, that tells me, you know, that that market there is, is you know, the, the, he has done such a good job of building up and branding and marketing his own railroad that there's people that want that, that car. And, you know, I'm getting messages from people that, that want it. So if if they came back and said, we're doing this car type again, it would be kind of a no brainer to, you know, rerun that Wisconsin and Upper Michigan car. Um, as I'm getting data, there's other road names that are a lot slower to sell. I probably would not revisit the exact same car type, though. I would be interested in, you know, might be interested in doing a different car type for some of the slower selling roads, just because we are building, you know, a fan base. And, you know, by by the time we're on the third car for a road name, we've gotten that image out there quite a bit. And and I think that with subsequent roads, and I have done some cars where we've got subsequent releases of the same road name, but different car type, they seem to sell just a little bit faster each time we, we do that. So, um, it's it's just a matter of timing, but absolutely, I would revisit older cars, especially if they, they did well. You know what's interesting about what you do, Chris, on this is listening to you talk about road names and like the rotation on tooling coming back up. Just as the freelance railroads are trying to mimic the prototype, you're doing the same thing. You're like when I talk to atlas or cato or bachman or whoever and say would you do this or that road name on that well you know some of those the southeastern roads don't sell as well as the western roads or we always like to have a couple of these in the mix and then pick a few obscure roads to make sure that the product mix works out so in a way part of your freelance operation now is that you're just like you know, scale trains or Athern or whoever, are we going to do Southern Pacific? Are we going to do Penn Central that you you get to do that, that this is part of your proto freelancing is you're just like a company of, well, we're going to do G35s. What, you know, who had them and what road names and what era and which that's kind of neat that you're actually mimicking and duplicating that as your uh, freelance situation. So how cool is that? Notably with a much smaller team, too. I only see one guy sitting in that yes, office. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it is just me. I do have a good friend, Doug Watts, that is retired. He's been volunteering a lot of a lot of time and helping helping me uh, navigate some of the issues of growing a, a small company that you've you've started from scratch. I do wish, you know, uh, like the Atherns and the, the big companies, I was working with, you know, some other corporate money other than just my own. <laughs> but, you know, there's definitely a shift in, um, you know, when I first started this company, it was an idea. And, you know, how do you tell somebody what what Home Shops is before you have a car out there? So, you know, the, the Tangent 4750, you know, order was our, my first one. It was all just an idea. And really didn't have any idea how quickly or slowly the different road names were, were going to sell. I just believed that, you know, the market was there. And, and it turns out that it was. And I learned, you know, which cars sold and which ones, ones didn't, didn't. But at the end of the day, it's a business, you know. And uh, if, if I'm going to be able to invest in the next run, 
the last run has to have at least you know re re recovered the investment that I made in it. So um, there there is some lessons learned. You know there are, there are cars I wish I had doubled the amount that I had ordered, and there are a few cars that I wish maybe perhaps I didn't do, but um, um, or or at least maybe it wasn't the right fit for the right type of car. Um, so I'm so I'm learning, and so every one of these runs that I do, it gives me data to see you know. How how are the cars that are doing well? Where where are they being advertised? Or, you know, what kind of a following did it have to start with? And you know, what is this road owner doing to champion it? You know, some some cars I produce and the road owners are you know just amazing and they they buy a dozens of them and they're generating posts and it creates excitement. And there's some road owners that you know will get their their complimentary set and you know you never see or hear from them again and they're just not generating that excitement. So it's that's all a learning game. There's no no car that I wish for you know that that I hadn't done, but there are some that I was surprised at how long it it's taken to turn the inventory. And um, you know, at the end of the day, when a car is available to me from a manufacturer, you know, it's it's if I'm going to do more than just one road name, it's a significant investment. And either either you know the inventory we've brought in is is going to turn has turned and and replenish the coffers or or not. So. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely a business uh, with all the stress that goes along with that. <laughs> but it's very rewarding to see these cars and actually hold a, a, one of these cars in your hand and, and see people buy them and see people post the photographs of them on their layout. That's that's very rewarding. Well, certainly it's fun to watch your company grow and as you learn and, and release and create new products. And we're just here at Around the Layout just cheering you on, Chris. It's uh, It's been a lot of fun and you certainly have been a huge support to the, to the podcast and provided a lot of great guests to the show and led me in that direction. So I'm always appreciative of that. Looking forward to seeing those 50 foot high cubes along with all the other products that you're releasing and glad you were able to stop by this morning and get us up to speed on Home Shops. It's a pleasure to be here. And Ray and Tony, both of you gentlemen have been amazing supporters from the very beginning. It's it's greatly appreciated. And uh, you your contributions to generating excitement uh, play no small part in, in our success. So thank both of you for uh, thanks to both of you for that. Well, continued success, Chris, and I am hitting the F5 key waiting <laughs> for my shot at that VNO non-sound C30. So awesome, awesome. I appreciate your time today. You're most welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for having me on. Well, Tony, always a pleasure to talk to Chris and learn all the new things that are coming out at Home Shops. He is always interesting, always has neat stuff going. I'm I'm so happy that it's doing so well for him. When he first announced all of that, I'm like, well, that is a neat idea. I hope it works. And it's been several years now, so I think it's doing pretty good for him. I'd say it's working and boy, it just adds a neat aspect to the, to the hobby with bringing all these freelance railroads up to the, you know, to the surface and being able to learn all the neat stuff that's going on and seemingly endless. And boy, I'm so appreciative because we got to talk to a lot of those folks here on the show with more coming that are uh, involved with home shops projects too. So very cool to talk to him. And before we roll into the news, I actually have something. Yeah. Usually it's you bringing stuff, but I actually have something. So Rapido Trains did a run oh, of yeah. RS 18 U's, right? Mm -hmm. Came out what? End of last year or so ish? A uh, handful of months ago. Really neat. Chop nose Montreal Locomotive Works for Axle. Yeah. Yeah. So our good friends over at A Hobbies in Warwick, Rhode Island purchased a run of those that are unnumbered. Ah. So CP Rail unnumbered and what they've done is they've commissioned a graphic designer and decal company to create road numbers for these and they have them available either as purchasing the unnumbered locomotive and then buying a decal sheet from them to number them yourselves or they have a limited supply of some of the 1800 series road numbers that are already decaled, ready to go. They've put them on the side of the cab. They put them on the umber boards and they're hundred percent ready to go. I got a uh, sample of one to bring home and take a look at. And I put it on the layout, ran it around a little bit. And then I put it up on the diorama that I have and I snapped the picture. So I'll share that on the Facebook page, a really good looking locomotive. And that red certainly pops too with that CP rail red. So 
Available from AA Hobbies in Warwick, Rhode Island. Neat shop. I was I've been there one time. Yeah, very nice shop. Very well organized. It's the hobby shop everybody should have in their neighborhood. And I'm certainly fortunate that it's not too far from me. So I get to go check it out all the time. But if you want to order from them, they do not have a web uh, e-commerce platform, but you can reach out to AA Hobbies. They're aahobbies at gmail.com. Or you can give them a call at 401-737-7111. Tell John that Ray sent you and you're looking for those Rapido RS-18Us. Very cool. You know, Rapido is celebrating 20 years in the hobby. Wow. I Yeah, that that's incredible. They are, though. And that's one of the things that they've announced this week as part of that anniversary. Uh, the first thing they did were Super Continental passenger cars, and I remember when they first came out. They're going to do two special ones. Speaking of kind of a home shops, they're Rapido. Uh, labeled one is like an SP Lark paint scheme, but it's lettered for Rapido. And then there's the typical kind of their the Via Blue with Rapido on it. And the cars are going to be priced at the throwback 20 years ago MSRP of like $49.95. Wow. Uh, and those will be out there. They're announced now. They're taking reservations for those now. The other thing Rapido announced in the last week uh, was a Pacific Fruit Express Ice Hatch Reefer. And when I first saw the announcement, I have to admit, I was like, yeah, you know, come on. We've had Ice Hatch Reefers back to Varney and Atherin Blue Box. Like, what is this? And so I went and pulled the Signature Press uh, Pacific Fruit Express book off the shelf. It's like, okay, what are the R4027s and R4028s? And why are these cool? And what they are, they are the last. They were built in the late 1950s. They're the last round of ice hatch reefers before the mechanical refrigerators take over. Wow. They are the typical kind of 40-foot steel with the four ice hatches on the roof. What I, th- I found exciting about them is they're kind of a combination. By the time they were looking for wider door openings, and, you know, the traditional little ice hatch reefer has those, like, two side-by-side hinge doors that open. And what they've done is they modified a couple of cars trying to get a wider opening to get forklifts in and out on these, and the result was the R4027, R4, uh, R4028 class production, which was a good, I think one of them is like, maybe combined there about 2,000 cars total. And the first ones, the 27s, have a plug door with the, they have one of those hinged opening doors. So it is a plug that opens and slides away to the left, and then that traditional little hinge two-foot door opens up at the side to give them the wider opening. Oh. And the next, the one after that is a slightly bigger plug door. I think it goes like four to six on the plug door side sizes. But check those out at repeatotrains.com. This is the first time that particular prototype has been available as a plastic ready-to-run model. So they are unique. There's something different and something new for the hobby. And if you can find a copy that all those signature press books are exciting. I don't know how old that one is. I know it's out of print, but the, their PFE book is a great resource too for that, that kind of stuff. Also, Walther's is retooling its main line. We talked with Chris about how his boxcars are kind of that IPD era car. And Walther's for their mainline series did the kind of one of the signature examples, the exterior post 50 foot ACF rail box a handful of years ago. But they've just announced a new version with dreadnought ends. And this is kind of that same car, but the rail box and the IPD cars were very much the, oh, kind of the Chevy with no power locks, no power windows vinyl bench seat that, you know, we just need a box car and railroads generally wanted something a little more, a little better. So you'll notice in this group of Walther's mainline 50 foot ACS with these dreadnought ends, you see like Frisco, you know, some more road names, uh, rail, regular railroad names rather than the IPD collection. Cause again, the railroads bought a little fancier, a little more, uh, you know, featured car. And that's a new tooling piece that'll be out later this year. And that's an HO scale. I just looked at the other day. I did a video. I I don't know if I put the video up on my YouTube channel or not yet. But Jacksonville Terminal Company 
sent me some of their 60 foot. This is in scale. They're intermodal flat cars. These are trailer train built by Pullman Standard beginning in the mid 1960s. 60 foot flat that carries containers. They kind of have the see through uh, lattice like deck to them. The thing that entered, and I didn't see it until I'd already looked at them a little bit and then saw some of the paperwork that Jacksonville Terminal included with the samples. They have their VRK coupler and new 70 ton, 33 inch metal wheels with nice profile detail on the front and back of the wheel, the face, the front and the back of the wheel are new for this release. And I know you're asking, what is VRK? It is very real knuckle. (laughs) Yeah, that's simple. So it is a little knuckle coupler. It's got a train line hose at the side, works in a, a body mount pocket on the car, and they're going to make both the wheels, those 33-inch metal wheels, and these VRK couplers will be available as separate issue. I'm eager to see. I looked at them. I thought they looked nice. I'm sending the flat cars off for review for uh, Model Road News Magazine to one of my reviewers, and we'll see. I'm sure they'll mate them up with everything but those old claw rapido couplers from the 60s and uh, see how they work and how they function but yeah new couplers new wheels and that flat car is really nice there's also a new standard height 20 foot container and that's from jacksonville terminal company jacksonville terminal they correct me if i'm wrong they started with n scale right and they were doing like n scale containers and correct then they started doing ho and i remember you saying on a past show that you kind of disliked that because now you had to it was actually fell within your realm now because they're doing (laughs) ho and then uh yeah, now they're doing cars and everything else. So neat to see that company growing, Jacksonville they, Terminal. Exactly. Yeah, that jtcmodeltrains.com is their website. They're based out of Florida, as I remember. And yeah, they've got a lot of different – intermodal is kind of their thing. InScale is kind of their thing. But there is some HO. There is some rolling stock in InScale so far. And they even have a couple of, like, kit things for, oh, like the entry gates and the little shack that would go with it for like a, a container lot. So there's some interesting things there to kind of sift through their website and, and take a look at. Awesome. Had a couple of books. And if you're not following, he's Nebraska based South Platte press. I love the, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a Midwest guy. So there it's almost always in my area of interest, but uh, Bruce Nelson, who did a book on the Chicago Northwestern E units in the last year, has a new book for South Platte Press. It's Burlington Northern E-Unit Finale, and this would be kind of that 1970s Chicago commuter, the big Cascade Green E-Units, which is neat because Rapido is working on those for an HO model. So if you want to know more, this soft cover book is a great, great place. I really like Bruce's Northwestern book on the Crandall cabs, And so when I saw this Burlington Northern, I was excited that it was coming out. I was about to ask South Platte Press, and I was digging through samples the other day, and lo and behold, here was a box from them. Like, oh, I hope it's that BN book. And it is. It looks great. It's a color soft cover book, southplattepress.com. You can find out more about this book and other titles from them. Another book, and I haven't seen it yet, but I'm excited. It's the Santa Fe Railway Historical Society is doing Ira Silverman is the rail photographer. It's Santa Fe in transition, the late 1960s into the 1970s. I think it's $35, is, and it's a soft cover book with about 100 some uh, color pictures in it and basically follows kind of that end of private passenger before Amtrak and kind of the developing intermodal and the changes that took place in, in the Santa Fe and railroading in general in that kind of exciting period of the late 60s into the 1970s. So Santa Fe in Transition by Ira Silverman is a new soft cover book. You can find out more. Those books are available from lots of places. You can, you'd probably, you know, Ron's books would have it and such. But Santa Fe Railway Historical and Modeling Society is a publisher on it. And I'm eager to eager to see that because there's never enough Santa Fe, is there? There's never any set in, uh, enough Santa Fe. And, you know, the other thing this proves out, it, it, I've said it many of times, if you are a young photographer right now, keep shooting and keep collecting your photos because eventually this era will have a name to it. And eventually <laughs> yes. you'll be able to put a book together of all the photos that you took of the current era. Because and I always think I go wow. track. Biden. Yeah. yeah. 
Because I go trackside and I think, oh, man, I miss the golden era when you see books like this. Mm-hmm. But, you know, maybe 40 years from now, maybe I will have a book, too. And then it'll be called, the, you know, whatever the, the whatever area era. Yeah, or and we're writing in the 2020s and how exciting it was. And we didn't appreciate it at the time and all that. Yeah, for sure. For exactly. sure. Always, always the case. Yeah. Uh, last thing, I got a couple of HO releases. I think I've had a lot of HO this time, although I had a lot of in scale in the last month or so. So apologies to the one one sixtieth crowd, but yeah, I'm kind of a heavy HO this time. Uh, Funero and Camerlingo. And I don't know if you, you will meet them at the St. Louis RPM that okay. Sharon, they're always there at that show. They make really neat kits. Uh, you can find out more. Their website is f and c kits.com. They have two Illinois Central Automobile boxcar kits in HO scale. And a lot of these kits, and if you think, oh, the, I think these are like some resin components and other pieces, and you think, oh, I don't want to build a flat stock kit, or I don't know if I'm up to that challenge. They, in the last handful of years, most all these have a one piece body. So they are a much, you know, that that part is that work is taken out. Uh, this is, I say automobile boxcar, and you might be thinking, you know, what, high cube? You know, what? no, no, no. This is an automobile boxcar like for Model Ts. Yeah. That this is a, a wood side. There's single door, double door. But a really neat thing, if you've never built one of their kits, check them out because they make all kinds of different and obscure prototypes as well as some common things. Finero and Camerlingo is the company and they're at a lot of shows. They always have a list of shows on their website that they're going to. So you can go to a show and kind of paw through all the kits that again, it's things you don't always see it at hobby shops all the time. So it's neat to see. And then finally, boy, perfect for everybody's model railroad. Broadway limited is bringing out that little Pincy 060. I've had a number of emails on it. A lot of people excited about it. This is that B6 class little 060 and tender. There are exclusives in the run. Heartland Hobby Dealers will have Pennsylvania Reading Seashore Lines examples. Oh, and I'm trying to remember now. I can't believe I forgot it. Train World has an exclusive road name too, and I'm trying to think what it was. But then there's a lot of Pensy ones in there too. Broadway-limited.com is the place to go to find out about that. Really neat new prototype coming in HO. I think it's due for Next year release, uh, speaking of Broadway, I spoke with our buddy Curtis Koch on both the new GP30 and Jeep 35s that are coming later this year. And I've got YouTube videos out on both of those that you can find on my YouTube channel at Model Train Resource. Awesome. You've been doing a really great job with those videos. They've been very fun to watch and like to see them. They're, they're quick hitters. You don't do you know, oh, yeah. long. They're just little quick hitters, but they're fun to watch. And, you know, so you're doing unboxings or you've know, been talking to some of the newsmakers in the hobby as well, doing little quick interviews with them. So that's awesome content. Definitely check out your uh, YouTube channel. We'll put the links in the show notes so that you can get there quickly. We typically do the Ask Tony at this time, but we knew Talking to Chris Palmieri at Home Shops was going to take us long, so we've uh, put that on hold this week. But uh, for an upcoming episode, if you'd like to have your question answered, go to aroundthelayout.com backslash ask Tony. Follow the instructions there to leave your voice message, and we'll select up to two questions each month. And yours just might be the one heard and answered here on the show. So definitely get over there and uh, ask Tony. You mentioned Model Train Resource. Where else can we find Tony Cook? Uh, you can go to shop.whiteriverproductions.com and see the magazines that I produce for them. That's Model Railroad News, which is 100 color pages monthly on all new products and reviews of current releases. Uh, I also do the quarterly diesel era. We're in the midst of doing Alco Century 415s and EMD SW 1001s. And speaking of it, the next, the second quarter edition I'm wrapping up and going into proofing on now will also have Louisville and Nashville GP40s will be included in there. That's in diesel era. And then mid-year, I'll have the HO Collector Annual will be out, oh, sometime probably in August. And it'll be 100 plus pages, a uh, soft cover book on older HO. So again, shop.whiteriverproductions.com. Awesome stuff, Tony. You're staying busy. You got a lot of stuff going there, but appreciate you taking the time to come join us on what's happening in model railroading and sharing the news. Always enjoy it, Ray. Awesome. Awesome. 
Thank you for joining us for this episode of Around the Layout. Learn more about today's show on our Facebook page, facebook.com backslash around the layout. Show your support by becoming an operating crew member at patreon.com backslash around the layout podcast. Past episodes and more can be found on our website, around the layout.com. And send us your feedback around the layout at gmail.com. Thanks for hanging out with us around the layout. <laughs>